They never denied that they knew him. They never betrayed him. They never slapped him or spit upon him or beat him or cursed him. I'm referring to the women who were in the crowd surrounding the cross of Christ. Today is the second in a series of messages that we're presenting, which we're calling Faces in the Crowd. And this morning, our message is simply the women. And I want to begin by looking at the unnamed women who were connected with the trial and the procession and the death and the tomb of Christ. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was being led from the place of trial to the place of crucifixion. The streets were no doubt lined with people. And among those people, there were women. And the scripture says that the women were weeping and lamenting him. We don't know their names, but we know they were there. And we know what they were doing. There might even have been women in that unnamed group who had been healed by Jesus. They might have had family members who had been touched by Christ. And they must have been wondering, why is this happening? He's done nothing wrong. And to those women, Jesus spoke. Luke says that he turned to them saying, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves. For the day is coming when it will be said, Blessed are those Wombs that have not borne children. Now that in itself is remarkable in that in ancient Israel, every woman who found a husband wanted to bear a child. Jesus said the day would come when it would be said, blessed are those who have not had children. And blessed are those who have never nursed a child. For the day is coming when they will run to the mountains and cry out that they might be covered. If they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? Now Jesus, we believe, was referring to the destruction of Jerusalem that was about 40 years in the future. And when he said, if they do these things in a green tree, he must have been referring to himself and the fact that if, if the Romans crucify an innocent man, what will they do to those who are in rebellion? What shall be done in a dry? Jesus spoke to these unnamed women. However, surrounding the death of Christ, there are a number of women who are named. So let's look at the named women in the crowd. The first is his mother. In the reading today from the 19th chapter of 
the Gospel of John, his mother was standing near the cross. His mother must have spent the last three years especially, but in a very real sense, all of his life of 33 years, Mary must have been perplexed because of what was said and done by Christ and to Christ. She must have been perplexed when the angel announced that she was going to be the mother of the Son of God though she wasn't even married. She must have been perplexed when the Holy Spirit came upon her and the Lord's power overshadowed her so that she would bear Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God in the flesh. She must have been perplexed when she told Joseph that she was pregnant. She must have been perplexed when she considered the gossips of her hometown of Nazareth and what would be said. And she was perplexed when they took the young child to the temple in Jerusalem to dedicate him and she was told by old Simeon a sword will pierce your soul. She must have been perplexed when at 12 years of age, he was lost for three days. Perplexed when he started his ministry and he made these great claims about himself. And yes, Mary knew who he was, but like the others, she did not fully understand. And so members of his family went out and laid hold of him to beg him to come home. Something wasn't right. And she was perplexed when he was arrested and nailed to a Roman cross. It was her boy that was dying there. But Mary was near the cross. And after the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, when that small group of 120 waited in Jerusalem, Mary was among them. Mary was one of the women in the crowd. But then there was Mary Magdalene. Magdalene refers to, no doubt, to the village from which she came but she's one of many Marys that are mentioned in Scripture. We're told specifically that Jesus had cast demons out of Mary Magdalene. And from that day forward, she would be a follower of Christ. And when certain women journeyed from the northern part of the land of Israel, Galilee, down to Jerusalem, and there were witnesses of what took place in Jesus' life, Mary Magdalene was one of them. And she was one of the last to leave the cross, and she was one of the first to go to the tomb. She was the first person that Jesus appeared to in his resurrected form, and the first person who announced his resurrection. Mary Magdalene, how grateful she was to the fact that Jesus had touched her. And then third, there is Mary. I said there are are a number of women whose name were Mary. There was Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. We don't know much about her. She was with the group that came with Jesus from Galilee. And her son, James, was one of the apostles, but there was another James who was an apostle. And so 
Mary's son James was called James the Less or James the Younger. He would not ever be as prominent as James, the other James and his brother John. But there's this woman, loyal to the very end. And then there is the Mary, the wife of Clopas. And some believe that she was the sister of our Lord's mother. But maybe not. Wouldn't it be unusual for sisters to have the same name? To have Mary, the mother of the Lord, and Mary, the wife of Clopas. It's based upon the passage that we read from the 19th chapter of John, and this is what it says. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. But what if we read the verse like this? Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. That's one person. And his mother's sister, two people. Mary, the wife of Clopas, three. And Mary Magdalene. It's not clear which it is. Perhaps there were two Marys in the same family. Or perhaps Mary had a sister who was at the cross, faithful to the very end. Now, there is another person that is intriguing who is a face in the crowd. Her name is Joanna. She is mentioned in connection with a woman whose name was Susanna. But I want you to notice that Joanna was Cusa's wife. And Scripture says that he was a steward of Herod. What that means is that he had control of some property that belonged to Herod. Now, the Herod that he served was Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod the Great, Herod the Great being the one who tried to kill all of the little boy babies when Jesus was born. But Herod Antipas was the murderer of John the Baptist. Jesus had appeared before Herod Antipas as a part of his trial, but no doubt because he had murdered John, Jesus said not one word to Herod. And Herod had a steward in charge of his goods. And these two women, Joanna and Susanna, may have been women of some wealth and influence. We're told that there were women who supported Jesus and his apostles financially out of their own wealth because of the position that Joanna has. She might have been a woman of influence, an influence perhaps upon her husband. Her husband is in the court of Herod. She is in Gal he, she is in Galilee, he is in Judea. She is one of those who supports Christ financially. Perhaps she was an influence upon her husband. At least we can conclude that he agreed with what she did. 
And then there is Salome. We believe that she was the wife of Zebedee and the mother of James and John. She was a mother. And like a mother, she wanted what was best for her sons. And she's the one who came to Jesus that day and said, Lord, allow my two sons to sit at your right hand and your left in your coming kingdom. And Jesus rebuked her mildly. And he said, are they able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? Are they able to bear what I'm about to bear? And the answer quite obviously is they would be confronted with the suffering that accompanies those who followed Christ. But he said, I can't give them the left and the right hand, but how, how like a mother, she wanted the best for her sons. But here is her greatest fact. She remained a follower of Christ beyond the end, the end of his ministry. There were women, some unnamed and some named, who were faces in the crowd around the death and resurrection of Christ. But here is where I'm going today. I want to talk with you about women today. I want to talk with you about women in the church. I want to talk about women who are right here this morning. And I want to say three things. The first is, I want to remind all of us, and especially our women, that women have always occupied an important role in God's plan for this world. When we look through the Bible, we see again and again how God honored women and important roles that they filled in the unfolding of the scheme of redemption. For example, in the Old Testament, there is a woman whose name was Abigail. We don't know very much about her, but we do know this, that Abigail would become the wife of David, the great king of Israel. And before ever she became his wife, Abigail influenced David to withhold his anger against an enemy so as not to slay the innocent. And he listened to her. You know, like all of you guys, you always listen. Your wives, don't you? Maybe I should say you hear instead of listen. But David listened, and it was a blessing to David so he would not have innocent blood on his hand. You think God used that woman? And then there is Hannah. Hannah, the woman of Israel who though she had been married for several years, had no children. And one day she prayed and she asked God to give her a little boy. And he said, she said, if you will give me a son, I will dedicate him 
to you all the days of his life. Guess what? God gave her a son. She fulfilled her promise. And that little boy was Samuel. One of the greatest prophets and a great judge in Israel, Samuel. Samuel, the one God chose to anoint the first three kings of Israel. And had it not been for Hannah, there might not have been a Samuel. In the New Testament, there is Mary, the mother of John Mark. The Bible doesn't tell us much about her, but we like what it does tell us. It shows us that after the beginning of the church, she opened her home for the brethren to come together. And in one of those gatherings, the brethren prayed for Peter, the apostle, because he was shut up in prison. And they prayed that, I'm sure, that he might be released. And lo and behold, he was released. And Mary, John Mark's mother, provided the gathering place. Then there is Lydia, the first woman convert in all of Europe a woman who was religious, but she needed to know more. And God opened her heart to the preaching of the gospel, and she obeyed the gospel. She and her house were baptized into Christ. The first converts of Europe. And how could we ever forget Lois and Eunice the grandmother and mother of Timothy. Timothy was brought up right. He was brought up under the influence of his grandmother and his mother. The father probably had little to do with his religious training because he was a Greek. But under the tutelage of a godly grandmother and a faithful mother, He became Timothy. And when Paul first visited their town, Timothy is converted by Paul. The next time he visits, Timothy impressed him so much that Paul took him on his preaching tours with him. He became his right arm and he called him his son in the gospel. Two letters in your New Testament are written to Timothy, a young preacher who bore such great responsibility and who was so dear to Paul. Women have always played an important part in the purpose and plan of God. I want to say second, that women are an important part of the community. Just look out there, and what do you see? You see Christian women who are taking their place in our society. Some of them are doctors, some of them are nurses, some of them are teachers, some of them are businesswomen. Some of them, bless their hearts, some of them are mothers who drive kids to school every morning and who are influencing their children in the ways of God. God bless Christian women who wherever they are in the community are influencing others for good. But then I want us to notice 
that women are important in the church. Women are important in the church because they are great servants. Now, the New Testament does not permit women to do certain things. And the New Testament does not permit men to do certain things, and it does not permit all of us or any of us to do certain things. We just always want to be listening to God. But in the church, God has given to us the principle of male spiritual leadership. That's also true in our families. Sometimes we men do very poorly in the positions that God has given us. But that's his plan. But women are so vital in the church. This morning, when you came to this building, you may have been greeted by one of our women. Our women teach children in our Bible classes. They teach women in our ladies' class. We men get up here on Sundays and say, we're going to have a potluck, but we didn't have one thing to do with it. Our women, our women minister to the sick. They take food to the bereaved. Over and over again, they, they are servants in the church, and how would we get along without them? But I also want to say that women are vital to our worship. They don't lead in worship. They're vital to worship. I wonder today, Richard, what that song would have been like if we hadn't had our women voices. And what encouragers they are. You know how you guys are sleeping and looking off in some direction? They're always looking at me. Maybe it's because I'm so pretty, but they're looking at me. They are more spiritual than we are. Do you know that? Look in any church, you'll find more women than men. And you will find more women struggling to support their family and raise their children alone than you will men. Women are valuable in our worship. And then I want to say that Christian women are women of God. The gospel is for all. Men and women are on an equal plane in relationship with God. That's what Paul meant in Galatians 3, 26 through 29, when he said, you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ, and there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. In standing before God, there isn't any difference. God has different roles for us to fulfill, but in approaching God, women can be women of God. And I want to say this to you this morning, that if you will fulfill the place that God has for you as a woman 
in his purpose and in his plan. You will never be simply a face in the crowd. But you will be women of God. Let us rise up and build the land.